So hello everyone, on behalf of uh, the Network for Migration Matters, we wish you all a very happy Human Rights Day. It is a pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to today's webinar, the United Nations of Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. We thank you for the time um, that you're taking to join us today. I am Chiara Maria Natta, Vice Chair and Head of Projects of the Network for Migration Matters, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Just before uh, we start, I would like to mention that this session will approximately last an hour and a half and will be recorded and made available on our website and on our YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, you will be able uh, to ask questions using the chat that's on the right side of this video. Um, we will try to answer all the questions at the end of this webinar, but because of time constraints, we might not answer all of them. Now I will pass the floor on to Imogen, the founder and chair of the Network for Migration Matters, so that she can explain what the network is all about and what projects we have coming up that you might be interested in. So over to you, uh, Imogen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. So. For those of us who don't know about Network for Migration Matters, we are an international and interdisciplinary platform which aims to bring people together from across the globe. Um, and we do this in a way which hopefully we connect and share information about migration issues, primarily through a human rights lens. We use a variety of mediums from blog posts to our arts programmes, which are launching in 2021. And of course, webinars like this one, which leads me on to this very exciting webinar today. This webinar is part of our UN 75 series. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the UN. And in the month of December, we have been and we will continue to celebrate this anniversary by bringing you lots of different content about the UN. This includes blog posts, an online photo gallery of the UN's work, resources, timelines, and much more. So please check out our website, which has more information. And to get regular updates, please create an account on our website and follow us on social media. I'm now gonna hand back to Chiara, who's going to introduce our fantastic speakers and the UNHCR. Thank you for that introduction, Imogen. And so sorry again for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, so, as many of you already know, and as Imogen previously mentioned, on the 24th of October, the United Nations turned 75. And in just a few days, on the 14th of December, the UN Refugee Agency, also known as UNHCR, uh, will be turning 70. And on occasion of these big anniversaries, we wanted to hear from UN personnel about their experiences working in the field of protection. So today we have the honor of talking with Roland Schilling, and Andreas Wissner about their nearly 30 years of experience working for UNHCR. So just in case uh, you are not uh, familiar with UNHCR, UNHCR is the UN refugee agency that takes care of the protection needs of and finds uh, durable solutions for refugees. They are also um, there to seek uh, protection of asylum seekers, internally displaced persons and stateless people. In 2019, at least 79.5 uh, million people around the world had been forced to flee their homes. Among them were nearly 26 million refugees, around half of whom were under the age of 18. As of 2020, the organization employs around 17,300 people in about 135 countries, with 90% of the personnel working in the field. So. Um, our two speakers are very, have very impressive careers and given that they will be speaking about their past and present posts, it is worth taking a minute to mention where they have worked. So starting with Roland Schilling, um, he has recently been appointed as a regional representative for UNHCR's regional office for Central Europe located in Budapest, Hungary. However, his career with UNHCR dates back from 1990 when he was a legal consultant for UNHCR in Hong Kong. Throughout the 90s, he was head of office in Zumdorf, uh, Germany, and Chisinau uh, in Moldova, and was protection officer in Sana'a, Yemen. In the early 2000s, he was deputy representative of UNHCR's representation in Berlin, Germany, and Ankara, Turkey, and served as senior program officer in Colombo, Sri Lanka. 
Between 2009 and 2014, he was appointed representative to UNHCR's representation uh, in London. And then from 2014 to 2020, he took up the position of deputy representative and then representative ad interim of UNHCR's regional office for Southern Europe in Rome, Italy, before coming to his current post in Hungary. Very impressive career indeed. And Mr. Andreas Wissner has an equally impressive uh, career. He was appointed representative of UNHCR's representation before the European institutions in Strasbourg uh, this year. His career in UNHCR started back in 1997 when he was an associate protection and repatriation officer in Quetta, Pakistan. During the 2000s, um, Mr. Wissner worked as protection officer with UNHCR in Paris, France, and had similar functions in Delhi, Timur, Leste, in Mashhad, and in Mashhad, Iran. From 2007 to 2013, Mr. Wissner was a senior legal officer at the Bureau for Europe of UNHCR's headquarters in Geneva, where he covered UNHCR's operations in Europe. He was initially responsible for the EU countries and then later covered Eastern Europe, Turkey, and the Balkans. In 2015, he worked with UNHCR's Global Learning Center, subsequent to an assignment as Senior Protection Officer in Nairobi, Kenya. Mr. Wissner was then appointed as UNHCR's Head of the National Office in Belize in 2017, before coming to his current post in Strasbourg. Uh, thank you both to um, Mr. Schilling and Mr. Wissner for speaking with us today. So, uh, without further ado, to kick off this conversation, we want to dive straight um, into uh, the hot topic that of the past and the present, which is, as maybe most of our guests in the audience have guessed, is the situation in the Mediterranean. So we would like to start with Mr. Schilling. Uh, we would like to ask you, what was your experience working on the Mediterranean uh, from UNHCR's regional office in Italy that covered the situation? And um, were there any significant changes before and after the EU-Turkey statement uh, that was uh, created in 2016? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much to be here tonight. Do you hear me well? Yes. yes. How, how is the connectivity? Well, I think we lost you for a second. Do you hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. Okay, good. I will give, give another try. You asked me about how my six years of work in the Mediterranean were, which included uh, the beginning of the crisis in Greece, where we were still responsible in our, my time in Rome. It was immense complex. And as you can imagine, it was one of the, probably for Europe, one of the largest displacement situation it had to deal with. In addition to the Yugoslav war since World War II, it was, I think, also predict, particularly um, important because it had significant policy and political implications. Um, even if you see certain election results or public discussions, um, you sensed importance. I think what is most important to see was, and what displayed the whole crisis in the Mediterranean was shortcomings you could say shortcomings of, of, of and are not in, in, in sufficient engagement by Europe in, 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 in its na neighborhood. Um, there was, an, you could say, a general attitude when the Syrian war started, it was still consi considered as maybe an element of, 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 of which was far, far away, but there was no real resource and policy engagement, the same with North African states. The second one, which I think shows certain weaknesses in the whole, or let's say policy challenges, which we're encountering in, in the whole question of refugee protection is, there is a global consensus to protect refugees, but there is no consensus which country is responsible. Um, the big topic, whether you can see comparable discussion in the United States or in Australia or in Asia, or in the whole of Europe is, um, refugee protection in general is, is something where most individuals and states and government embrace this principle, but there's no question where these 20.5 million persons who have crossed international borders, who has to take the responsibility. In, in Europe in particular, it triggered a discussion about the whole common European asylum system, notable the Dublin regulation. The third, let's say, big experience was 
how we, and it really showed a, a deep crisis in the question of how we manage mixed migration movements. Um, if we are frank, I mean, at the beginning, for instance, from an Italian perspective, if we were based in Rome, at the beginning, most of the people who came were Syrian refugees. Uh, but you had increasingly also people who were coming from what we call, it, with their profile, were, were in need of international protection. We had definitely individuals who were very much traumatized through the way of to, to cross the Sahara. But we had also persons who had, let's say, no international protection needs, independent from the question that protection needs as such. And that opened up the whole issue again of how, I mean, there's a lot of talk about mixed migration, but there's indeed not too much creative thinking on how do we manage that uh, so far. And the, let's say the, 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 the final topic, the, 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 the fifth one is, um, it's the whole discussion about, and you could say the aftermath also of the movement, large movement of Syria, which had various reasons, not enough resources, not engagement, and not enough to do with the host community, which then also led to the um, the whole the global compacts and the New York Declaration before on, uh, on uh, for refugees and migration, um, utilized also you could say a, a, a progressive agenda or a, a solving agenda by many states, a, a level of maturity which we haven't seen before, uh, for instance, in Europe, also by the European uh, actors, by, by some governments, but it reacted also, you had a counter reaction which was utilized by, in a general sentiment that governments have lost control about mi migration management to a mixed with sometimes some and mixed migration that we're seeing in Europe um, that was a problem of the past and it's also maybe a problem of the present and also how Absolutely. how um, politics <coughs> nowadays is it's it's hindering protection needs or is hindering the protection that uh, um, people coming in masses to Europe uh, are, are needing and I, I want to ask Andreas uh, do you have uh, similar views as you have been working in or had worked in the Europe Bureau in um, in uh, Geneva, do you have similar uh, conclusions? Yes, uh, thank you first, uh, uh, Chiara and uh, Migration Matters Network for giving Roland and me this forum for um, sharing some thoughts on very important issues that have become much more important at the, for the general audience since they as they were 10 years ago. And that's also what I perceived when coming back to Europe after a break of almost exactly uh, 10 years, well, a little bit later, a little bit less actually, um, how the uh, virulence of the migration and refugees debate, but also the level at which it is being debated currently in Europe has, has increased. Now, this is a, is a question on which governments can be it can be toppled and that makes big policy and um, political headlines, which was not the case in 2013 when I left the, the Bureau for Europe. It, on the other hand, of course, the same issues that Roland has already described were already there when I joined the Bureau for Europe in, in 2007. We had already uh, refugees arriving uh, in the, the Mediterranean, uh, coming to Lampedusa and uh, requiring uh, reception and, and protection. And the, 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 the essence of the discussion was already there. But then, of course, uh, the Syrian crisis uh, developed and the mass arrival uh, catapulted the whole issue to completely unprecedented uh, levels of, of political importance. So now um, being in Strasbourg, I think um, it's a very interesting um, uh, position to observe also the Mediterranean situation because um, that's where uh, most of the hotspots actually are um, of refugee protection in Europe are currently uh, located, uh, be it still Italy, maybe currently maybe to a little bit lesser extent, um, but but particularly in in Greece, in in Turkey, in in Malta, and now most recently again in the in the Canary Islands in in Spain, um, these are the the, the, the places uh, where basically European um, asylum policy is put to a, a test and where new creative um, tools are being uh, tested uh, with uh, uh, Lesbos now uh, supposed to become an, a laboratory for the uh, trying out the instruments 
that are being proposed by the EU Commission under this EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. But I'm not the specialist to talk about this one, um, because in the end, I'm privileged and happy to be in Strasbourg, where we have the European Court for uh, of Human Rights, uh, which is really um, has become a last and final instance to adjudicate cases of, of persons who have exhausted um, national adjudication mechanisms and who can then um, refer their cases uh, to Strasbourg to prevent uh, return to a situation uh, where their um, freedom and their uh, their safety may be, may be at risk. And uh, I'm very happy to, that UNHCR can contribute from here uh, to prevent the worst and to uh, provide a level of protection in Europe to um, to those people who urgently um, need this protection and also to, to collaborate with the several entities of the Council of Europe um, to ensure that pushbacks are not um, increasing uh, more than they already do and to, to, to reinforce messages with the like-minded actors of the, um, of the um, Council of Europe and together with UNHCRs, we can achieve much more in, in cooperation uh, with our friends, given that the Council of Europe is really has a specific mandate as a European um, human rights uh, watchdog and also a defender of good government and uh, good governance and democracy in, in Europe. So no, thank you. It was really interesting to to hear about the work that UNHCR does with the European Court of Human Rights, and especially how they're stopping deportations that are occurring maybe from Greece or other areas in in Europe. And uh, we're going to further talk about um, what UNHCR in Strasbourg does uh, with regards to this. But I want to go back to a small uh, point that you made. And I want to see what Mr. Schilling has to say about it. Um, what do you uh, think of this term that Lesbos is uh, a sort of test or a sort of lab to see how uh, European uh, policies uh, with regards to migration is, is uh, turning out? Hmm. I think, no, 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 I think that, that there's we have a, we have a, I go back to the question of solidarity. There is a there is a challenge in one point, which let's say where governments coming in and where there I think are, are in, in immense challenges in reality coming up. If we want solidarity, and that's something let's say a, a topic which is very important for Greece, Italy, for the you could say for countries in the periphery, like also for Spain, because the non-solidarity, the, the current system of Dublin, which basically foresees that wherever you touch ground, I will come back to Lesbos, but I have to go. This country is responsible. Had created three reactions. We had one reaction, which was I summarize a bit. This was the Spanish one, building a very robust wall. I mean, um, you talk about the wall between Mexico and the United States, come to Europe and see some of the fences. This is high tech, which creates, by the way, created also that. Then you had the Greek approach by a asylum system, which was almost dysfunctional until recently. Um, really dysfunctional to a point that, by the way, the court in Strasbourg, where Andreas is sitting, said this is almost a human rights violation to apply for Greece because the asylum system doesn't work, the reception didn't work and so on. And that was the situation in 2015. And then you had the Italian approach, which was until recently waving people through, which was very annoying for the Northern Europeans. Now that changed, that changed. And that came with the hotspots because the Northerners saying, well, hey, we need to change the game. Uh, now, if you say we want solidarity in Europe, that means it means at the end of the day that people who arrive in Italy, in Spain, or in Greece would maybe be moved to Sweden or Finland or the Netherlands or wherever, Ireland, every member state of the European Union. The question is, should you do that basically for everybody or do you should do it only for a person with a refugee or potential serious asylum background? And for that, you need some form of a screening system. Now, if you do screening, you have a problem. You need something like fast systems or, in this sense, laboratories. And the Italians were very resistant on it. I knew very much Italian reader because they said, basically, we don't want to add up like the Greek islands. You create a humanitarian issue there by having holding centers. Then, well, in order, you can only enforce this if you have detention and so on. So I see dilemmas. 
uh, we are in principle not, not against that you have some form of a border procedure or pre admissibility procedure to see whether people are seriously want to apply for asylum. Maybe also pe persons who are clear refugees very quickly to identify them and persons who have a very clear claim not maybe to have a, a fast procedure, a fair procedure to them. The problem is then how to manage that. And so far, the management was very bad. We are all very open about this with all kind of even humanitarian implications. So we're a bit mixed on that. So border procedure in principle, yes, uh, probably different than the way it has been done so far. Very interesting points uh, to, to use. Uh, what I'm understanding is that you're saying to use the past and build on from the past and, and, and get better. Um, but also to that you can see that when you start and you think that you have a solution to a problem, you can encounter a new problem that you haven't uh, expected uh, in the past. For example, as you mentioned, hotspots arrived and, and, and resulted because of some policies that some countries did not like, that uh, people were entering very easily or much easily into their country. So then hotspots were created because to limit the, the entry of these persons. But it requires goodwill. And the problem we have seen in Greece was partly that if you are actually not intending to create facilities which are up to humanitarian standards, and I'm not saying whether that's not possible or not, because we're talking partly about countries who have very effective tourist industry and receive millions from some ideas, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's not fit for purpose. And um, that we have definitely seen. So thank you for this. And now I, I think we had a lot uh, to talk about with the Mediterranean and there's still a lot to mention. But let's go back into the past and, and let's talk about your previous uh, positions that you've had. And um, Mr. Wissner here, I see that in 1997 you actually started off with this post. Uh, you were posted in Pakistan in Quetta and uh, you were working in the refugee camps uh, with the procedure of uh, voluntary repatriation. Uh, could you talk us uh, through the experience that you had both in the refugee camp and with um, the procedure of voluntary repatriation? Yeah, thank you, Kara, for going back a little bit in time. I don't want to bore anyone, but it was really the fascinating, most fascinating post in my career that probably motivated me to stay on with UNHCR because it gave me really a unique opportunity to see things that I've never even dreamt of. Um, working both in refugee camps on refugee status determination, which is UNHCR's um, mandated responsibility. UNHCR is exercising this on behalf of the government in Pakistan that is not party to the refugee convention. And we were also at that time, and we still are, as far as I know, involved in significant voluntary repatriation of uh, Afghan refugees who were living um, in Balochistan in our case, and but also in Karachi, in the urban slums, back to uh, Afghanistan, in our case, back to the south of Afghanistan, mainly the Kandahar and Herat uh, regions in a time when the Taliban ruled the country. And the Taliban, of course, you know them, they are, um, were, had installed sort of an Islamic, uh, Islamist state and system. But the refugees happened to be rural Pashtuns who had come to uh, Pakistan as a consequence of the Russian-led wars. So they were not afraid of the tribal and Islamic systems. To the contrary, some of them saw the rule of the Taliban as an opportunity re to return to their own country. So a UNHCR, um, of course, had to respect their uh, wish to return back in safety and dignity um, to, uh, to their homes. And that's what we facilitated by uh, organizing huge truck convoys from Karachi. I accompanied about five to, to seven of them personally to ensure that they could dismantle their housing in uh, the suburbs and shanty towns of Karachi, which was really a very squalid living condition, and to go back to their villages around Kandahar and, and Herat. That was an amazing experience. Also meeting with the Taliban. Um, it uh, was a trip back to the Middle Ages, uh, but um, going there. But at the same time, of course, I used to work in, in Quetta doing refugee status determination and camp visits, refugee status determination for Iraqi and Iranian individual asylum seekers who used to come uh, to Pakistan in order to claim 
persecution, individual persecution by um, their governments, and that had to be adjudicated uh, for UNHCR. And subsequently, the Pakistan authorities would tolerate uh, the um, ones who were screened in uh, pending their re uh, resettlement to a third country. And uh, that was our task for UNHCR to do because there was no and there still is no uh, Pakistani asylum authority. So that was really what motivated me to continue. And my second post was then in Mashhad in Iran, where I saw the Afghan situation from the other side of the of that country. So what a very interesting story and what a very interesting experience that you got to live both sides of, of, of of the situation from two different posts and I think this is one of the nice things of UNHCR uh, that you really get a global perspective to a certain point of, of global issues um, and I think now it, it it is time for Mr. Schilling to tell us about IDPs. Um, we hear about refugees and how Andreas Wissner has mentioned uh, returnees and, and refugees, but we hear of this term IDPs continuously, internally displaced persons. And I think um, your, your experience in Sri Lanka with the earthquake that occurred in 2004, um, there might be something interesting to mention there. What did UNHCR do at that point? Were internally displaced persons in the mandate or were, uh, was UNHCR dealing with IDPs at that time? Because I see you were posted between 2002 and 2005. So um, it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say about your post in Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, Karen, thank you so much. Indeed, I was there the very day the, the, the tsunami in Sri Lanka, but I was not posted because of that. I was there because of the IDP situation caused by the civil war in Sri Lanka. Which is, by the way, an interesting, you could say, a very interesting operation because it was the first time in the history in UNHCR, not when I was there, but actually in the 80s, when we moved, when we set up office there, that we dealt with not persons who crossed an international border. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's not forget, up to 1980s, we were the organization which were always behind the fence when people crossed the fence and and became refugees uh, or were refugees because they crossed an the international border, but who, who had all criteria of, of refugees, but not crossed international borders in Sri Lanka. And that was an exception because the government agreed to it, both conflict parties agreed to it, the secretary general agreed to it, and resources were provided. So that was still, you could say, the first time we were into, not only into the country itself, but you could say worked in a conflict zone, um, which then moved on to the former Yugoslavia, which was then actually the more large operation where, you know, the typical imagination of Indonesia trying to enter where people are displaced, like these days in Tigray, in Ethiopia, and is more typical what you expect from UN and UNHCR with these tents, that was actually evolving out of the Sri Lanka and the experience from, from the former Yugoslavia in the war. Um, my work was fascinating because we mainly worked with persons who returned. That was, uh, there was a ceasefire between the LTT and the government. It was not, you know, the time when you could say the North was completely controlled by the government. So you had the de facto authorities we dealt with. So you had all the issues, we, how do you deal with de facto authorities? And we helped people to reintegrate um, basically in the jungle uh, after years and years of ex absence, which gave a lot of lessons that, for instance, when you organize return programs, it's much more complicated than just to organize transport but also you have issues of property rights, how do you start livelihood, and you have then the whole complexity, when does emergency stop and development start? So the whole question of UN reform came in, one UN, Man, many of these pilot pro programs, uh, the four R's, um, you know, how do you build re reconstruction, repatriation, rehabilitation, how do you merge that together? We tested Sri Lanka, fascinating. Um, you could say the end was, or the end of my time was the, the last six months was then to, to respond to this immense catastrophe of the tsunami, which, which hit us. Um, there was a lot of soul searching in the organization. Should we have done it? Should we not? There was no soul searching if you're in the middle of the catastrophe like this, when uh, 30,000 people die within a few minutes. Uh, you, have, you had 500,000 people uh, without a shelter. Uh, it was also the days, you remember then, it was the first time where there was some thinking about let's get away from multilateralism um, by one very important country. 
in the north of America. So there was the idea maybe it shouldn't be the UN who takes the lead of, uh, of, 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 of the relief action. And that was when the then Secretary General Kofi Annan said, no, it's the UN who takes the lead. So within a few hours, we were sitting together in a room, um, I remember very well, and we basically said, you do education, I do the shelter, you do this. Uh, there was not much discussion about it. There was then still a lot of research. And that was then my major work, focusing on, on the rehabilitation work, because we couldn't, we would have lost too much credibility if we say we are the largest UN agency there, we're the most operational agency there, we have relief material for it, but we don't help people uh, because it's not within our mandate. We jumped over our mandate, which makes complete sense, sense. Let's not forget, we had also a lot of colleagues who lost their parents, their next in kind, who were burying the first day their own relatives. It was quite traumatic. Um, and I remember that then a senior UN official came in and said, oh, how complicated that was to make us a decision. Um, it was anyways too late. We just went ahead. So uh, very interesting, and, and it is true. Sri Lanka was really affected by uh, almost 30 years civil war, and 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 the country is is still to this day kind of rebuilding itself. And it's interesting to hear that UNHCR not only thinks of of protection, but thinks of durable solutions, thinks of development, of rehabilitation, and and this is really what makes protection worth it. Protection isn't only a one one instant thing, but it's a thing that has to continue over time. And it, it really is interesting also to see how UNHCR and the UN system was flexible, uh, that even if they have mandates that are uh, stated in treaties, they do when there is a humanitarian crisis or there is a, a climate disaster such as the tsunami, they, they don't kind of hesitate and, and act. So that was interesting to hear. And now moving from the past, let's move to the present, <laughs> because both of you hold very interesting posts. And I would like to start with Mr. Schilling. Um, you were very recently put into your post. Uh, only in October, you have taken up your post uh, um, in Hungary. But would you like to continue talking to us about solidarity in the EU and actually give us your views on the migration compact uh, which was uh, just released a couple of uh, months ago. Do you think um, it created any fundamental changes as to how the EU will address migration? Uh, do you think there were some steps forward? Um, do you think that there are still uh, more issues that have to be handled that um, the EU migration pact might have left behind? I know it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me. Um they, they, they are, okay, you, for maybe for those who are not based in Europe and maybe have a vague idea about Europe, there is a big contradiction in Europe. And the, the one thing is that Europeans are forced to have a common approach to asylum and refugee protection. The reason relates to the fact that if you don't want to have borders between within Europe speak, if you want to have tomatoes quickly moving from Spain to Germany and industrial products uncontrolled from Italy to, to the north and vice versa. You don't have border controls and if you don't need border controls, you need more or less the same asylum and protective system. You can't have it different there. You know, just And that forces harmonization. On the same time, the topic of refugee protection migration is so politically sensitive that it really goes in a very sovereignty of states, particularly for some countries which are just regained sovereignty. So this creates friction and also political ground. So um, if something comes from Brussels and you have to do it because others are saying it, it's migration can be unpopular and it can be even more unpopular. And that's the big, let's say, the polit political environment on which the migration pact comes in. And as mentioned, if you have a system where every, every the country which comes, or let's imagine you're a U.S. citizen, or you have, let's assume that the states who are just close to the Mexican borders are fully responsible for every refugee arriving, but not only that, they have to take everybody, you would consider it as an unfair system. So you need a system of solidarity, and the EU pact is an attempt to get it, but it is at the, at the end an attempt to... Um, to find a compromise between the Southern Europeans, 
the Western Europeans who probably pay the bill and the Eastern Europeans who have a very strong focus on sovereignty. And a compromise is never easy. You know, it's also not something which you can't, you always have some points. So I think that's legitimate. What is also where we feel sometimes not so easy with, there's a very strong focus on border control, which is important. But just control doesn't make it. You see, we need also more, as I mentioned, engagement by a resource-rich resource, resource -rich area of Europe in the countries of region. And we are also partly concerned because let's see, we, to be frank, when we look about uh, international solidarity, we have 85% of the poorer countries or neighboring countries who take all the burden, which used to be 70%. And you have a policy dialogue in the moment or aim, which says, how about you don't take 85%, but 90, 95% or all the burdens. People should stay where they are. And that's something where we have to say you need, if you want that people don't cross illegally or let's say informally, then you need robust resettlement programs and others. So, and there's not a lot of talk about it, but not really lip service. So the pact in general are good, but there are elements which definitely can be improved. Very interesting uh, answer, and and very interesting this this data that you gave that 85% of people being hosted in in countries it's in developing countries, and this goes against the rhetoric or the speech that we hear or we heard in Europe saying oh, everyone is always coming to us, but it's not necessarily the truth. If you look at the global situation, as you mentioned, 85% of 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 person seeking international protection there in 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 developing countries so so this is also another uh, important fact that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at migration especially in in, de in developed countries um, and and we have to also start uh, shifting out to the the political uh, rhetoric that uh, creates this hate or or this victimization of of developed countries as if everyone is coming and burdening them when actually <laughs> in real life developing countries are actually the ones hosting more more people and andreas uh, we here we talked about uh, the eu but there's also another international organization in in europe and it's the council of europe and it's very interesting um, to see how UNHCR is collaborating uh, with the Council of Europe and how the Council of Europe also relies on UNHCR um, for some tips and for, for some help, not only in developing legal policies, but even political policies uh, in Europe. And, and the Council of Europe has a bigger um, stretch. It, it has 47 member states. Uh, compared to the European Union that has fewer. Um, so what does the representation uh, of UNHCR in Strasbourg do with the Council of Europe and especially with the uh, European Court of Human Rights? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chiara. In, indeed, I, I was quite amazed when arriving to Strasbourg uh, over the summer and the difficult conditions, but to see uh, how much the Council of Europe is actually doing uh, for the defense of human rights, good governments and democracy in, in Europe. And it's, it's amazing that 47 countries, basically all of Europe, with the exception of Belarus, um, have committed uh, to the fundamental principles and values that are enshrined uh, basically in the European Convention uh, of, uh, for Human Rights that is just celebrating its 70th, 70th birthday. And that is being celebrated all over these days, and of which, of course, the, the European Court for Human Rights is the, 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 the ultimate guardian. And we have the privilege in, in Strasbourg working together with the European Court for Human Rights, um, of Human Rights, and um, also with the rest of the Council of Europe in all its uh, standard setting, monitoring and uh, cooperation um, capacity. Um, all the European countries have committed to the values enshrined in the European Convention of uh, Human Rights. And that goes, I believe, much beyond the um, catalog of rights that the European Union has created. First, because it's, it's pan-European, it goes beyond the, the core Europe, of, uh, um, basically, which was founded on economic premises, uh, free market ideas. Uh, but the Council of Europe was born after the Second World War based on the painful experiences at, at that time, similar to the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, which will also celebrate its 70th birthday next year. Um, 
in order to uh, prevent what happened at that time to happen again. And also it contains a joint commitment to compassion and humanity, which is again included in the in the binding commitments of the European Convention um, of Human Rights and, and Article 3 in particular of that convention, uh, the prohibition of uh, torture and, and inhumane and degrading uh, treatment um, has uh, helped UNHCR uh, to create a safety net uh, for protection in collaboration uh, with the European Court of Human Rights and the other institutions of the Council of Europe to prevent really the worst from happening and is being uh, respected by and large by almost all European countries. So this is really for me, um, even if the EU pact uh, falls through and Hungary doesn't comply with its obligations, uh, in the end, when cases uh, come to the Strasbourg court, um, then uh, in, they will have to, to give in or they will have to be in breach of, of, of their conventions according to the European Convention of Human Rights. And um, then there is a possibility uh, for all individual applicants, if they are uh, aggrieved by some action and they don't have any um, recourse according to national um, to the national um, uh, courts in, in the country where they find themselves in um, to file directly an application under what is called Rule 39 um, of the court's procedures to the European Court of, of Human Rights. And, and that has helped and we are collaborating with uh, lawyers that are bringing forward uh, these kind of actions to the court uh, to ensure that, that persons who risk to be returned to situations um, where they may be tortured uh, where they may risk persecution uh, would be granted uh, these uh, these uh, um, uh, these orders by the court and that is often the case and often in collaboration with um, the, this discrete collaboration of our office in Strasbourg but of course in addition uh, to working uh, with the, the rule 39 unit of the court um, we are also um, submitting third party interventions um, out of um, we have already since um, 99 uh, we have uh, submitted more than 40 interventions as a third party uh, as UNHCR uh, that have helped shape the uh, European Court's jurisp uh, jurisprudence on uh, refugee and migration issues. Uh, one very prominent case was the one of Hersey and others versus Italy uh, in a situation of um, uh, pushed back of, uh, in, in the Mediterranean where the court ruled that Italy was um, also responsible. Uh, I mean, the European Convention of Human Rights also applied in, on international waters uh, when the Italian Navy acted in international waters trying to push back people to, uh, to Libya. And there are many other um, successes already uh, through, this, uh, through this engagement. Of course, this is not only UNHCR in, in participating in these kind of interventions, but there is a whole judicial engagement network, as we call it, consisting of several offices, specifically the country offices on the ground, headquarters, the Brussels office, um, that makes UNHCR's a third party intervention is quite powerful in this regard. And then we are uh, participating in various other institutions and bodies of the of, of the Council um, that um, work in synergy uh, because of the human rights um, mandate of the Council with our uh, concerns. For instance, the um, Migration and Refugees Committee of the Parliamentary Assembly, the Commissioner for Human Rights, the Convention for the Prohibition of Torture, um, the ECRI, this is the European Commission um, against racism, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, our presence there is working quietly, but I think effectively to support uh, the rest of what UNHCR does and wants to achieve and stands for in Europe, but even beyond, because of course Europe has a bit of a lighthouse function in terms of implementing its protection commitments, also for other parts of uh, the continents of the world. Very, very interesting and, uh, and particularly interesting uh, to hear you say that even if uh, some countries won't comply with some EU law or some, some European law, um, fundamentally there's a European Court of Human Rights that will go and look and see if, uh, violates, uh, if human rights 
were violated and, and they're going to make um, countries respect their obligations towards um, persons seeking international protection. So it's very interesting. And it's very also interesting to hear that UNHCR has been intervening um, with third party interventions in the European Court uh, since uh, the 90s. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned 1999, over 40 interventions. Uh, and these interventions potentially make jurisprudence and, and create minimal standards across Europe of um, what protections need to be guaranteed uh, for persons entering Europe. Um, just uh, since uh, this year, uh, COVID has also been a, <laughs> a hot topic. Uh, very briefly, in one minute, um, how has your operation been affected by COVID? Um, was it suspended? Did it continue? Did it adapt quickly? Um, I would like to hear from both of you. Andreas, you want to go ahead? And then well, but just very quickly, I had the, the, the privilege, quote unquote, to see uh, the COVID, UNHCR's COVID response, both as a head of office in Belize and as a, an incoming representative in Strasbourg, two completely different operations in Belize. What I saw, uh, really UN uh, acting as one uh, under the lead of the resident coordinator, um, the new strengths and role of the uh, uh, resident coordinator, there was a pooled fund available uh, that UNHCR could draw from and we would all uh, participate to the health in the health response together with uh, WHO, of course, focusing on uh, refugee hosting areas and communities, uh, purchasing personal protective um, equipment to the persons of concern uh, living in these communities. That was a very interesting experience in that sense. Um, then coming to Strasbourg, uh, of course, I saw how things pro probably suddenly started working virtually, where we thought that conferences are needed. Now we are seeing uh, uh, video conferences and on uh, many different types of platforms. And it's working um, It's working amazingly well in order to pursue the technical agenda of the different bodies of the Council of Europe. Everything is virtualized at this moment as we speak, uh, but of course the interpersonal element and the subtilities are lacking. And Mr. Schilling, do you have uh, similar experiences? No, I think for us, yeah, no, I mean, I was in Italy when at the beginning, and as you know, that next to China, the first country in Europe which was heavily affected was Italy, and uh, we had complete, I mean, we basically w completely changed the way of working. We didn't stop working, we changed the working, like I think most of us all around the world are doing. That means we moved something which was from office, we went to home office and virtual. That was the easiest. What is much more challenging and that you see probably less in Budapest, but as more we are field oriented is all our question of outreach to our person we care for. And that continues, but there are risk factors. We have a lot of colleagues, by the way, who became ill. We have also uh, some colleagues who died uh, because of the COVID, which is most unfortunate, but um, this is concerning and this is still very tricky because on one side we are obliged and we need to stay and to deliver services around the world uh, on the same time we have also certain response now we have responsibility to our staff to keep them healthy so how do you manage how do you do that in practicality tremendously uh, challenging well first of all we want to give our condolences to your colleagues who have unfortunately died because of covid and we hope that uh, your colleagues that have um, had the virus, uh, they recovered quickly or will recover quickly. Um, and now let's go to the future section. <laughs> and hopefully the future will be a little bit brighter. Um, we want to talk about the Global Compact on Refugees. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it seems like it's the document uh, that refers to the future of the protection of refugees. Um, uh, but we want to hear about the effects of the Global Compact um, on host communities, what is it attempting to do in host communities? And maybe you can refer to some experiences in the past um, to, to talk about how the Global Compact is, is attempting to, to affect host communities. So uh, Mr. Schilling, your experience in Yemen uh, might be interesting to mention in 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 this. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had a free discussion. I think that came up because I think I was in Yemen in 97, 98, and that was as, as you know that was 20 years ago. We, it was a very poor program. I mean, we had a, we had very much. I mean, mainly taking care about Somali refugees who came across the uh, the Horn to to Yemen, and um, 
we had very little resources, so we focused on our refugees and we totally forgot our communities around. Uh, not forgot, but there was also no funding. And that had, to a certain extent, even security implication. Uh, we had hostage taking, we had colleagues who were kidnapped. And the demand of the, the hostage taker was, we want jobs with UNACR. Uh, and there were villagers who basically were behind that. I mean, we couldn't give them jobs because that would have been a very difficult incentive and so on. But we settled, I think, for a water pipeline. But why I tell this little anecdote is it is a problem if you help and you leave communities around um, by themselves. I mean, I, there's also a story in Djibouti there where people pretend to be refugees, although they were locals, in order to have access to certain services which we provide. But I think the most striking example and maybe the most worrisome one, and that I also put down why the global compact, and you could say it was invented, was, was the Syria crisis. I mean, it became very clear if you have a situation of um, a country which is not only a terrible conflict, but which is literally collapsing in itself and has massive form of displacement. I mean, these 22 million Syrians, you have the, the majority actually who are internally fled conflict. You have around uh, six, seven million people which are internally displaced and then four million refugees. That created immense resource requirements which you could not anymore just um, utilized with, with, with the typical emergency funds. I remember that Guterres, now Secretary General, our former High Commissioner, he came to London when I was the representative in London uh, for, for the office, and he made it very clear to the British counterparts by saying, you can give us all the money of emergency, it's not enough. Look at countries like Lebanon, look at Jordan, health system is collapsing, the schools are sort of, I'm, and I thought already, he thinks in a way, I like a secretary general, I'm concerned about security issues and the political implication it has if we don't help host communities. Out of this discussion, how do we move in the World Bank? How do we get in development actors? How do we get go away from the classical either emergency or development approach? Because it didn't fit countries like Lebanon. They were not poor enough for development aid and emergency wouldn't address the shortages of the services, the global compact idea was born. And uh, that was the major idea. And I think still this is a great idea. This is important. Uh, now we now our job is it to, to make life, to make life in it, because it's nothing else than a political commitment uh, so far. And, and Andreas uh, Wissner, uh, you were in Belize and um, I think Belize was uh, a, uh, had a pilot project that was going on for the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. And um, it would be interesting to hear you talk about um, how the pilot project went on and what this CRRF or this Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework is. Yeah, exactly. As, as, as Roland has already explained, that uh, host communities is something that need to be kept in mind in refugee response. And that's what Belize also came to realize, that we, we came to realize that uh, Belize has only, stand, only stands to benefit from uh, early application of the principles uh, contained in the Global Compact on Refugees. But it was not um, it wasn't passed at that time when Belize started applying it. It was the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants um, from uh, uh, 2016 that then um, had as one of its annexes the so-called Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework under which these pilot projects were actually developed. And Belize joined a regional mechanism uh, that is called the uh, Comprehensive Regional um, um, uh, uh, Refugee Response Framework. It's in Spanish, it's called the MIRPS. Uh, which uh, which encompasses Central American countries and Mexico that are sharing a similar migration context and, and collaboration in this regional framework, which was also done in a part of Africa, um, has really uh, kind of galvanized new energies, new ways of thinking between the states and also has attracted donor attention to the subregion, region uh, making it possible for UNHCR uh, to, to conduct with its partners much more meaningful and comprehensive operations now um, so um, that has already worked out quite well but also for Belize it has meant uh, that we have received money to really work with refugee hosting communities um, that um, that um, um, need to be won because they are also voters 
um, and the voters are deciding uh, in a dem small democratic government as is Belize, um, who will form the government and if they will take a, a refugee friendly stance or not. They may be um, they may be party to the refugee convention, but that doesn't mean that they actually recognize refugees. The, 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 the government that was in power until a month ago uh, said, no, we are not going to recognize refugees because our electors uh, don't want it. They're against uh, migrants coming, overwhelming us from Central America. Now, if we can give them some benefits and um, the host communities that you can also get a share when you receive um, migrants and refugees, they all see it as one global part, um, then um, you will also receive some material benefits and some reward for it. And this will benefit your own communities. Uh, development actors will mobilize for you. You will not be left out. And there is a regional framework promoting that police will not be left behind. So that was for us the, the concrete benefit. And I hope now with the new government, which was just elected, finally, um, the refugee recognitions will follow and uh, these theory will be followed by good practical implementation. Well, we will also keep our fingers crossed for that from over here. And uh, we want to hear, well, first, uh, before uh, Mr. Schilling, um, when he was talking about his experience in Sri Lanka, you were mentioning that uh, you had to coordinate activities uh, with other agencies. Uh, for example, someone had to provide the shelter, someone had to provide education. So I, I want to hear about how, um, after the New York Declaration that you've mentioned, uh, Mr. Wissner, how um, are there any institutional ch uh, challenges uh, with UNHCR? And uh, what is this relationship between IOM and UNHCR after that IOM has become a related agency after the New York Declaration in 2016? IOM now is incorporated into the UN system. What is the relationship between IOM and UNHCR? Uh, and this question is for Andreas Lissner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chiara. It's of course a, a very sensitive one in the sense institutionally speaking. So I can only say from my own experience that uh, working with I IOM has been always very rewarding and it's really essential working with IOM uh, because they can deliver on issues that, UNH that are beyond UNHCR's mandate. You see now also, especially in the European context, that uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but a majority of uh, migrants uh, arriving to Europe are not uh, adjudicated found to be refugees so that the question of returns arises. Uh, the integrity of an asylum system needs to be maintained also by assuring a, a safe and dignified return of those who are not adjudicated to be refugees, otherwise states may, may lose their interest. Then the mechanism of, of uh, receiving refugees and migrants in a human rights um, conform uh, manner are almost the same, uh, be they recognized, uh, be they asylum seekers, migrants, and refugees, well, need to get special status, of course. So the, the, the collaboration with IOM seems to be um, all the more crucial than ever. So I really hope that um, UNHCR and IOM um, can get to a new um, level of coexistence now within the UN framework um, to ensure that these, these, these urgent needs are, are covered soon and that there will be more institutional, inter-institutional debate and also uh, doctrinal issues will be discussed more between the agencies uh, towards maybe a closer coordination at the headquarters and the field level. For instance, in Strasbourg, we have no IOM representation. Uh, we have UNHCR and um, they have a different tradition. Uh, we are rights-based. We have a clear mandate. Um, IOM has used to be more an operational agency. So there is still a lot of work to be done, but it's very important. And I think the, the compact, the EU compact will also be a catalyzer uh, for, for, for this development in future. And uh, Mr. Schilling, how was your experience working with IOM, particularly in Italy? And yeah, I'll ask this question first. <laughs> In, in, in Italy, I had wonderful experience, and then I'm not saying just because it's a semi-public forum here and to be very diplomatically, I had a very good experience. I have also very good experience here in the region. We are actually just signing now a letter to the government of Moldova relates to inclusion of both migrants but also refugee and asylum seekers in COVID response. You know, so quite often governments forget our our persons we take care of, and it's good, important that not one UN but several UN agencies, if we gang up and we, we have more weight. But the topic where I talked about Sri Lanka is indeed the whole question is how UN agencies work together. And there have been a lot of think 
thinking and an attempt to do that in, in a more joint form. A lot of progress has been achieved. There are challenges, and the challenges are not in relation to jealousy, competition, um, resource competition, but quite often in the DNA of the agencies. You have some agencies which are more headquarter based. The other ones are more operational. Um, others are maybe have a strong mandate, like UNHCR is we, independent from whether we have good or bad relationship, we have to protect refugees. Others are pro project related, speak they only do that where they get money from. And that does these pieces far away, it looks like it's easy that they fit together, like UNICEF can do education and we do the, let's say, protection for refugees and the others do health. But in reality of life, it could become a bit complicated. And as I said, it's more in the design issue than, uh, and that we need to fine tune on the field level. Um, so a lot of good thinking from far away sometimes, it's challenging in the field. And, and Mr. Schilling, uh, you were representative in London at a certain point, and I think we have lots of Londoners tuning into our, our uh, and lots of people in the UK who are tuning into our webinar. And I think it would be interesting to hear about your experience very, very briefly there, and particularly how UNHCR was working, uh, well, in around London, there are lots of political think tanks. Um, that do a lot of reflections on possible solutions that can be implemented on the field. Um, are there any problems sometimes uh, with trans uh, translating their work from theory into practice? Um, what was the role of UNHCR with these political think tanks in, in the UK? Yeah, I, I must say 90% of the work was UK home affairs. So, I mean, but but I mean, being based in London, you're automatic, you're getting invited to various forums, whether they're somewhere in the triangle between Oxford and Cambridge and London and, and Exeter and, and many other places. And I must say for me, London and you can say the UK, like the East, East Coast of the US or certain places are absolutely important when it comes to thinking and dialogue uh, about global issues. They, they, there's a lot of creativity happening there. It's, it's impressive for me. It, they're, they're very important. And I personally also enjoy it. If you come from the deep field to be in a place where you can intellectually change practicality of the ground with global issues, uh, London is a fascinating place. What we need, what is quite often important to connect it back to the field. And sometimes I wish think tanking is happening actually also more down in the region. And it was, I think, an Italian professor when we thought about Eritreans on the move, who's, who said, why do you don't put somebody rather in the region, maybe in the Sahel zone, than do it from far away? Because quite often we get some theories which are okay, but then you have the reality, the complexity of the reality where it's sometimes difficult to translate. And we get this often with the discussion about resilience. Uh, we have the same how to strengthen resilience. We do now a lot on risk management. It's again something which came recently, which is an important factor. But how do you translate it in the reality of Myanmar, where we have programs, so Sri Lanka is another issue. And now I think this will be the easiest question to ask, but the hardest one to answer. <laughs> and with this, we conclude our webinar, but people will ask questions and you can answer them after this. But which was your favorite post and why was it your favorite? Any one of you can answer. <laughs> Well, well, let me let me go ahead. I think I'm keeping fond memories of several posts. In particular, if, if I go in regressive order, um, Belize, um, then before that, uh, Geneva, uh, but then also Paris. I mean, I I was really privileged being uh, working for UNHCR in, in all of these places. Also, Dili in Timor Timor Leste, Iran, and but. But still, I would come back to uh, to my first post in in my apprenticeship, so to speak, for UNHCR, working for UNHCR in Quetta in Pakistan, because of the diversity of the work that I had already outlined in the beginning. Um, having a, a training on the job on refugee status determination, but also going to the refugee camps that had been there already for ages, and I think they're still around today, and uh, doing repatriation work, which was really epic and working with the Taliban and moving all around. I, that, this was really, I think, by hindsight, still the best of it. But the rest was was just good and and kept me um, staying on and, and trying to do my best to contribute. And Mr. Schilling? 
I, I think it's very similar. It's, so, it's such a difficult question, not an easy answer. Intellectually more stimulating London, uh, probably success-wise maybe Germany, because I think we really shaped to re-liberalize the German asylum system, which was very restrictive. And I think I had some footprints in that. Uh, life-saving impact, Sri Lanka, Yemen, personally very happy in Hong Kong and Moldova. But probably most shaping, really shaped me and, and put my mark. And by the way, I used to have dark hair and all my hair turned gray within two years was Yemen. It's a beautiful country, amazing, you know, a drama every day, really impact, fascinating. And I still think have a lot of fond memories of Yemen. <laughs> So very interesting. Uh, if if you you want to have fun, you need to have gray hair. <laughs> I think that's the conclusion. <laughs> Not necessarily fun. It was definitely drama. But I ah I think most important. I realized in Yemen, and that comes quite often, that all my experience. And qualification was, I'm not saying completely irrelevant, but pretty irrelevant. I needed to reinvent myself. You get, you learn a bit element of humility and humbleness if you suddenly realize that, you know, certain skills are not so important and you need other abilities. So thank you very much for the patience that you both had with all my questions. And now we have some questions from the audience. We're going to take about 15 minutes if if that's okay with both the speakers and the audience. Um, the first question is, how much work do you, uh, do you have with, uh, do you do with grassroots organizations and how important do you think they are in dealing with the refugee crisis? This question is for both our speakers. So maybe uh, Mr. Wissner, do you want to go first and then Mr. Schilling, you go, you follow after? Yeah. I, I think it's a very good question. Grassroots uh, organizations, maybe relating to civil society, to um, organizations beyond the, the, the usual interlocutors in government. And that's, I think, one of the principles also of the Global Compact, uh, the comprehensive, uh, that is, that is uh, recommending a comprehensive approach, uh, a holistic approach uh, for UNHCR to engage with uh, community-based organizations and the whole of society, as it is called. And grassroots organizations are, of course, antennas on the ground. They may represent refugees as well. They may represent other parts of society. If they have something to contribute to UNHCR's response, I think UNHCR must get much stronger in engaging in field operations with these organizations. Of course, in a liaison presence at Strasbourg, that's not so much the case by, by, by nature of our, our work. Uh, absolutely important, and I must say that being a significant culture shift within our own organization. We were, okay, we had the typical NGO, big NGOs where, you know, we partly and then we on pass part the work and then they do it. Uh, but there is a complete rethinking about what we call community-based protection, that quite often our real protection work, I mean, besides advocacy work, and we don't have, let's say, the court behind us, like the Strasbourg human rights system, is advocacy can only be done through society and grassroots organizations are so important in two ways. As uh, Andreas mentioned, telling us what happens, but also in the advocacy part in, in, in promoting it, but also shaping our own programs. You see, uh, we are asked always get refugees involved in your own program, but this is the typical dialogue you talk with senior people, but quite often it's the not only grassroots organization, refugee organization themselves who helped us. And we have, for instance, now super interesting programs in Italy. It's almost like a refugee parliament exists who shapes our own programs. And there's so much to learn from. I mean, um, they know much better than we quite often what's happening in the daily routine. So yes, very, very important. So now we have a COVID related question. Um, what new issues do you see developing for refugees and internally displaced people as a result of this year's pandemic? Should I start? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, well, well, there's a lot. The, the most dramatic impact it had in many places is economic livelihood. By the way, it's not the health, yes, but I mean, you know that health will start with people in my age and older, but I'm not saying that young people don't. But uh, the most important had that, for instance, the whole informal sector in Europe collapsed also through COVID. Typical, I mean, restaurants, think about where where things stop these days. This were also many where asylum seekers and refugees are working the same in 
of urban, the typical refugee is not in a camp, it's in an urban setup, trying somehow economically to survive. Livelihood is a big problem. We have no onwards movement in Europe because people lose their livelihood and move on. The few who stayed in our region in Central Eastern Europe are now moving to the West, all COVID related. Besides of that, Inclusion is a big, important factor, but, um, you know, and if you lose your livelihood, you lose your housing and so on. Andreas, yeah. Yes, um, I mean, I fully agree. Um, it, much has been said about uh, about COVID and refugees, and, and in fact, it has increased the vulnerability of already vulnerable group. And it, this is, uh, of course, closely to be monitored, but also it may lead to um, an impoverishment of, of uh, refugee receiving countries, and they may be less welcoming to refugees as well as a consequence of the crisis, uh, looking at how much money is now being spent to contain COVID. So we will see maybe one, two years down the road uh, what the actual impact um, would have been. So um, uh, someone in the audience said thank you to the organizers and Mr. Wissner and Mr. Schilling. I would like to know how um, open to influence our developed nations to urinate your suggestions and its work in general. <laughs> so uh, Andreas, uh, Mr. Wissner, if you would like to go first and then Mr. Schilling. <laughs> okay uh, well i think that's a very good question and it's also yeah uh, difficult because uh, i think advocacy doesn't work overnight i mean it takes so much repetition and and uh, new formats to be tried out and different different uh, difficult uh, no, a diversity diversification of interlocutors uh, for advocacy and it has to be strategic also to uh, to be targeted to the, to the uh, most effective ones and and I, I believe uh, UNHCR is on a on a good track but working increasingly with partners uh, in this, the methodology of the, the global compact in particular um, would help us to reach uh, a better impact in in future, um, the, like these grassroots uh, organizations that I mentioned, and as Roland has underlined, um, they help us to carry our message uh, further and longer. And people can speak with more authenticity than UN bureaucrats uh, if they're personally concerned uh, by um, by the messages. But we have to win their hearts and minds first, so that they can speak our messages as well. If, if I understand the question correctly, it was the influence developed country have on our policy, is that correct? Uh, no, it's how open developed uh, countries are to UNHCR's suggestions and its work in general, and UNHCR's work in general. It's, it's very, very different. You have countries, you know, there's one country I don't want to name who basically has declared us persona uh, non grata and thrown us out um, in Central Asia, and we have other countries where we have one, not only wonderful, sometimes I feel like we are, we are, we are like brothers and sisters in action. And um, uh, to a point even that if you see a law, you feel like, oh, that is, could be written by a UNHCR protection officer. I mean, um, a senior protection officer and its quality. So there, are, I mean, you have a very good and very close relationship. You have sometimes also dependency created. I mean, I've just, um, that's a long story. I have actually a mentee who talks about her challenges in her government, which is in a developed environment on how much we maybe have done, you know, something funded since 20 years and we create dependencies. But we are also, I think, in very close dialogue with governments. At the end of the day, the UN is nothing. You know, we don't have we don't have a state. We don't have resources. We're very much depending on what governments do, including what the governments are doing where refugees are hosted. And these are two major developed, underdeveloped countries who have challenges with development. Thank you. And we have two more questions. Uh, so this question is concerning uh, the situation in Greece. Uh, the person uh, writes, the recent fires in Mordia uh, camp showed extreme prejudice and hatred towards refugees. How do you propose that we tackle instances like this? Maybe Mr. Schilling, you'd like to go first and then Mr. Wissner. Yeah, so I'm not sure about all the dynamics. You had both. You had first welcoming and then also incredible. You have also seen the Phoebe as a factor. And um, it's an interesting topic because I actually had just a discussion yesterday with a very important 
Hungarian NGO about protection work, where we do, by the way, a lot of litigation also together. I mean, think issues where we basically ending up as a party in a court procedure in Strasbourg or in Luxembourg. But we also are very clear that if we lose the public narrative, protection will be very difficult to maintain. And you see that in election results, you see how important, I mean, we are non-political agency, but it's a very political topic and it's something we haven't engaged enough. And that's the public discussion. And um, coming back to the German example, where I said one of the successes was to liberalize the asylum system. We actually con convinced the, where the resistance came from. I mean, I'm not talking about the progressive, but more what you generally consider the ones who is a bit more nationalistic, inward, fearful parties to a pop. And they agreed, but they looked then at me and said, you need to help us to move the population with us. And that was a very interesting message. One of these key words I remember, we need to carry people with us. Mr. Wisner? <laughs> Yes, I would agree with what uh, very much with what Roland said last. Uh, take the population with us, win the hearts and minds of the, the population. And that's not an easy undertaking um, because uh, we, we are lacking the means. We are not positioned. We are, we are a group of lawyers and and um, not bureaucrats, but we're working mainly with the established systems, but not so much with the public at large. That's something that can definitely be improved. And and we we need to 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 have the ways and means to do it. But I think uh, uh, influencing public opinion is something that can work mainly in partnership again. And we need to provide the uh, the opinion makers the tools and the information that allow them uh, to 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 spread out messages and to show that that refugees are also contributing to the societies that they're arriving. That 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 really. Uh, European societies will thrive better if they receive migrants. There is a shortage. I mean, uh, there's a need for more people in Europe anyhow, uh, because <clears throat> uh, otherwise pensions may not no longer be paid in, in 20, 30 years. So there needs to be immigration policy in, in Europe. So why not focus also on people who are in need of international protection and integrate them? Uh, at the Council of Europe, there's a very interesting project, the um, European um, qualification passport for refugees, certifying their acquired diplomas from the countries of origin um, that are that is facilitating the integration in the job market um, of persons uh, coming to Europe and, and showing how important they, their contribution can be in the health sectors and in other sectors in the technology sector. So these, these kind of projects can help to, to Im improve the understanding uh, of the general population um, for refugees and, and the compassion to help them. So from our network, well, we want to help uh, UNHCR carry people with them, <laughs> um, as you mentioned before. I think we have one last question, um, and it's related to, we have many students that are tuning in and many young uh, professionals tuning in, and it was a career advice. What career advice would you give them uh, when they're applying for UNHCR. Um, I remember Mr. Schilling uh, mentioned that in Yemen, they kidnapped some colleagues uh, and, and uh, held them for ransom. And the ransom was that they wanted to get accepted into UNHCR and wanted to work for UNHCR. But I don't think that's the advice that UNHCR wants to give. <laughs> so what advice would you give <laughs> for anyone who's applying for a position in UNHCR? I think what is important is, is, first of all, you need to really commit it. You know, quite often, if I do job interviews in this society, I would say, and what motivates you? And if somebody says, I want to have a career with the UN or I want a career, then normally the person is out. If it, it, you need in order, because we have also probably a quite challenging job, you need to be convinced in the protection mandate of UNHCR. So it's, it's, it, it's, that's, I think it's, it's, interesting the topic expertise is an asset i think for students i can quite often we want to have people who have already bringing some expertise in some topic with it so it's good to have be for instance know a lot about refugee law but maybe another topic like information management or data management or if you know a bit about law and water or that would be an asset and i must say why because if you suddenly in a situation like Sri Lanka and you're responsible for the well-being of hundred thousands of individuals 
Um, you have certain gaps in positions. And if somebody says, I know this, but by the way, I know how to make maps or I know something else, this is an incredible asset. And that's what we're looking often for. So yes, be interested in a topic, learn a lot, but I would say try to get somewhere an expertise, which is a kind of a niche. This might interestingly actually help you with finding a job. Yeah, I, I cannot add much to, to this very insightful guidance of, uh, from, from Roland. I just want, wanted to add that maybe working for UNHCR is a bit of a, a choice of life as well. It's not just the choice of a career because it, it puts you before hardships that you wouldn't experience in, in many other um, fields of work. As, as exciting as it may sound and as exciting as it may be during your uh, first two or three postings as an international staff in UNHCR when it comes to the fourth or fifth posting and you need to remove your family and your school kids that you may have by then, uh, you see in particular the hardship that it entails as well. So that's something that's a bit of a caveat. You need to be certain that you want to follow that through. And unfortunately, you see also in UNHCR um, several failed uh, families and relation relationships um, uh, that uh, that needs to be kept in mind by, by those who are very enthusiastic of following this uh, this career. But it's it's still worthwhile if you keep that in mind. Okay, there was a last, last minute uh, question, and I know UNHCR adapts well to, to unexpected uh, events. So this very last question is, um, this person writes, thank you for an incredibly interesting webinar. Which steps is the UNHCR taking to reduce the length of stays and increase collaboration of organizations providing services in refugee camps? Can I, I need to... Think. <laughs> How to I'll repeat again. Um, which steps yes, is the UNHCR taking to reduce the length of stays and increase collaboration of organization providing services in refugee camps? So I, I assume this person is asking how are the length of stays of refugees in refugee camps reduced and how is UNHCR um, collaborating with organizations in these refugee camps to reduce the length of stay? Um. I think we are, we are both not really camp management specialists and and I have must admit I that's one of the experiences that that's lacking from my career having worked in a, in a major refugee camp uh, for for UNHCR where where these questions become more more acute but of course it's it there are many protracted situations where people have been staying in, in camps forever but that's mainly due to the fact that there are no solutions available so the best possible uh, solution for reducing the length of stay in a refugee camp is to provide an alternative uh, to the refugees uh, to find a durable solution. And, and often when that happens, th there is a deadlock with the government that doesn't want to integrate the refugees staying for long periods in the, in the camp. And also they cannot still go back to their own country and cannot be resettled because resettlement is just for a very, very few. So they become stuck there for a very long time. And often uh, UNHCR, it doesn't have the instruments to change that, but can just maintain uh, people in a in a very precarious situation and provide minimum of protection and do its utmost of advocacy in order to change the the, the larger situation and con contribute to peace building processes, for instance, uh, behind the scenes uh, to 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 reduce the periods of stay of these populations. Well, I can just agree. I mean, I, I had some, let's say, camp experiences in Yemen and to a lesser extent in uh, Sri Lanka. There's a, there's a general policy for us. We don't like camps and we try to get people out of camps as quickly as possible. And we see camps always as a second or third solution within how to, to, to accommodate people, unless it is an emergency situation where you have to... At, at the beginning to address them. And you see this also in the figures. I think more than 50% in the moment of all refugees are urban refugees. That's, by the way, not a nice life. It could mean that people live in, um, you know, in slum-like conditions, just trying to manage themselves through. But my experience by seeing, talking, just also the, the, the psychological people are psychologically much more dignified if they're some for self-reliant, maybe some form of assistance, um, then, then if 
you wait in a kind of wait and wait and wait situation in the camp. And we have now higher situations of second and third generation of camp uh, populations in, 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 in extreme cases. But as Andreas pointed out, this is quite often either linked to the protectiveness of the situation or because there's a strong political, how can I say, um, demand of a camp to keep people in the camp situation in order not to integrate them. And the solution often, if you can't return people, integrate them or, or find a resettlement option. And there we probably need to be more creative. Um, but we need also political support often. You know, quite often governments say you need to do more. Everybody says, but in some countries we are also a very lonely voice if we tell the government be a bit more forthcoming and welcoming to refugees. Very interesting answers, particularly Mr. Wissner's answer, um, where he said that alternatives need to be uh, uh, um, looked for. And actually, very interestingly, UNHCR, if I'm not mistaken, UNHCR Strasbourg collaborated with the Council of Europe uh, last year, and this year actually released a course on alternatives to immigration detention, which I think um, some people of our team will be sharing on the chat a link to this course if you're interested in taking it. But a uh, very interesting conversation that we've had. Um, it seems like we've gone through the past, the present, and the future of the UNHCR, and not only UNHCR, but international protection and, and how to deal with international protection um, collaboratively. It seems like UNHCR uh, needs support from other people, although it is doing a lot of work on the ground, a lot of work in policy making, and a lot of work with laws uh, before the European Court of Human Rights, for example, helping with the jurisprudence over there. It seems like UNHCR needs support uh, and wants to collaborate with a lot of people. Um, so we really thank um, Mr. Roland Schilling and Mr. Andreas Wissner for joining us and for um, teaching us and about uh, the work that UNHCR does and for sharing their views of the organization and the great work that they've done. And we hope that your career keeps on um, allowing you to get more gray hairs because apparently gray hairs <laughs> equals happiness. So <laughs> we wish you a prosperous um, future. Uh, and uh, we hope that you keep up the good work and that we can help the organization in any way possible, not only the Network for Migration Matters, but anyone who's watching this webinar. So again, we would like to uh, extend our thank you to both our guests for joining us and for the audience for the patience that they've had with all the tef uh, technical difficulties that we had at the beginning. And hopefully we'll have more of these sorts of webinars in the future with UN personnel sharing their experiences working in the field of humanitarian aid, particularly in international protection and migration. So once again, thank you again, and please visit our website um, to get more information on future initiatives. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the opportunity, Karen. <laughs>